prevailing theory or hypothesis regarding cholesterol is if you have cholesterol in your blood, and we typically talk about LDL typically, and more specifically, maybe ApoB is, is kind of the, the latest thing, but really ApoB and LDL, they run the same way. So if your LDL is high, your ApoB is going to be high. It's just effectively the same thing. But if it's high over a long period of time, you're just going to get cardiovascular disease. End of story. No discussion. We've got a bunch of people whose cholesterol is ridiculous. Hi. Most of our data on cardiovascular disease and atherosclerotic is generally done on sick people. You know, you just don't get CT angiography on a bunch of healthy people. The suggestion is that healthy people, metabolically healthy people, don't seem to accumulate plaque. If you get your cholesterol to zero, you're unlikely to have heart disease. Now, the problem with that, and I liken it to, is like, if you want to cut down your risk of having a sexually transmitted disease, just cut your damn penis off, right? They didn't even account for how much sugar was being eaten by these groups. So it's like, what, how is that good research? I'm like, look, you need a study that shows a beef, like, beats diabetes. Up until now, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, you, got, you go up to the, the average person on the street and ask them how much steak they eat. And they're like, oh man, I love that stuff, but oh, I don't I can't eat much. Got to, I got to watch it, right? They're told, they, they literally believe that it's going to make them die if they eat it. This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan. And I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality, independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Today, we got an exciting episode. We got Dr. Sean Baker on the line. Sean, how's it going? Uh, it's going well, man. It's good to be here. Glad to have glad, glad to have the opportunity to speak to your to your audience. So good. To, good to, I think good it's to uh, an exciting time. A lot of uh, you know new research coming out that we want to dive into. I know Ryan yeah. is definitely stoked to oh, get yeah. into that. Ryan, how you doing? I'm good, man. Let's just dive in. I'm excited. Yeah. So. Sean, why don't you, I guess, fill us in. What is so exciting about this new research surrounding cholesterol and obviously how that ties into a carnivore diet? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, and, and actually there's quite a bit of research coming out. I know the researchers personally, and they've got, they're going to drop about two or three more research studies that are all going to be sort of narrative shifting in my view. And then I'm also in contact with a bunch of research groups getting some funding so we're going to get more research going so it's going to be an exciting you know year or two with with nutrition in my view um so i guess probably you guys are referring to this the the uh baseline data that matt budoff dropped at the uh, world insulin resistance conference in, in la uh, a couple of days ago and that was kind of the it, it's sort of the effort, you know, the, the seven-year-long effort of a guy named David, David Feldman, who is an engineer. He's not a doctor. So he's, I mean, he's taken a lot of shit because he's like, he's not a doctor. He's not a researcher. How dare he, some uncredentialed heathen, you know, <laughs> question anything, you know, where are your credentials? So he's been, he's been battling that and, and doing it quite, uh, you know, in a very humble fashion, I have to say. I mean, he's been, you know, he's, he's been very diligent about talking to some of the world-leading authorities on this and you know, getting laughed at, and sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll honor him with a, uh, you know, a little bit of dialogue. But, but anyway, so the, the the theory is, I mean, so the conventional wisdom, I suppose, I would say wisdom. I say the the prevailing theory or hypothesis regarding cholesterol is if you have cholesterol in your blood, and we typically talk about, you know, LDL typically, and more specifically, maybe ApoB is is kind of the, the latest thing. But really, ApoB and LDL. They run the same way. So if your LDL is high, your ApoB is going to be high. It's just effectively the same thing. Um, but if it's high over a long period of time, you're just going to get cardiovascular disease. End of story. No discussion. Don't even bother to question it. You know, it's unethical. In fact, some of the scientists are out there. It is unethical to study this in any other way. You know, so you're running up against that. I, I see the same thing around meat research. Oh, it's unethical to study people on a carnivore diet, right? It's just kind of crazy. You know, because we don't, we don't know what, what if it shows something. <laughs> that we don't think so we better not study it right so um so they said hey look we've got a bunch of people whose cholesterol is ridiculous high. i mean you know we're, we're using u.s units i mean you know they tell you over 190 milligrams per deciliter total cholesterol or ldl cholesterol rather no total cholesterol is a bad thing right and we want your ldl below 100 ideally and so they got people rolling in there with ldl cholesterol 300 400 500 nearly 600 um which you know, it should indicate development of atherosclerotic disease. Um, 
and on average about five years of, of exposure. So that's a, that's a, a relatively long dose. Uh, I know there are people at the critics still say, well, it takes years and years and years to do this stuff. But remember, all these people are in their 50s, some in their 60s, some in their 70s. It wasn't a young group. And the other thing is, so they enlisted this guy named Matthew Budoff, who is literally, arguably the world's expert on something called CT angiography. So coronary CT angiography. So they'll take a CT scan. Uh, they'll do they'll do contrast dye into the blood vessels so you can see any sort of uh, encroachment by you know, plaque uh, into the, into the, in the, uh, uh, the, the coronary arteries, whether it's, you know, calcium, obviously you're going to see, but the, one of the criticisms of a coronary artery calcium scans, you can't see any soft plaque. Well, with this, any encroachment into the lumen, so any, any accumulation of, of, of plaque uh, will be shown. Now it might not show some of the sub endothelial stuff, and that's been another criticism, but by and large, it is a very precise, very high resolution study. And according to him, you know, one year, you should be able to see change. There's plenty, and that's why their protocol, because there's a part two of this study. But what they found was, and, and really importantly, is because most of our data on cardiovascular disease and atherosclerotic is generally done on sick people. You know, you just don't get CT angiography on a bunch of healthy people. There's no reason to, right? So we have very little data on that. And so they fortunately, there was another study going on called the Miami Heart Study where they wanted to, they, they looked at healthy people and said, what's, what's this, what, what does it look like for healthy people to have angiography? And so they found an age matched, uh, you know, demographic match group, you know, all the factors are essentially as close as they could possibly make them. And they were able to find, you know, 80 people from their study and 80 people in this other study. And if you were to say, you know, you talk to the average cardiologist, you know, without, without any sort of foreknowledge and said, hey, what's going to happen? What's going to be the result here? Well, clearly the people with the super high cholesterol are going to have more plaque. I mean, that's just what we expect. And so what did they find? They found out that not only was there no difference, I mean, there was no difference in there, significant difference in the amount of plaque. Neither group had much. So, but the other thing is the higher cholesterol group tended, I mean, it wasn't statistically significant, but it was tending to be even lower than people that didn't have very much, you know, that had very little cholesterol. And so what it says is, you know, I mean, obviously there's going to be more studies to confirm this, but, you know, the suggestion is that healthy people, metabolically healthy people don't seem to accumulate plaque, um, you know, just regardless of LDL cholesterol. And this is not new data. I mean, there's there was data out of the Western Denmark Heart Registry that was done in 2022 by Mortensen, and they showed basically the same thing, but they looked at it a little different way. They looked at people with zero CAC scores, zero coronary artery calcium, and they looked at uh, clinical endpoints, something called MACE, major adverse cardiac out, uh, endpoints, heart attack, stroke, uh, death, uh, you know, need for you know bypass or revascularization procedures. And what they found was if your CAC score was zero, it didn't matter what your LDL cholesterol was. So, again, we're seeing this that perhaps uh, – uh, there's a chink in the armor of this LDL cholesterol is always bad no matter what. And it could be that, hey, it's bad under these certain conditions, which I think is I think is really more accurately what's going on. I think it's it becomes what I call a dependent variable. You know, it's a it's part of the causal pathway. You need it. I mean, you know, if you get your cholesterol down to zero and, and some people advocate for that, right, um, then you're very unlikely to have any cardiac events. I mean, it, it, it actually has happened. But but generally speaking, if you get your cholesterol to zero, you're unlikely to have heart disease. Now, the problem with that, and I liken it to, is like, if you want to cut down your risk of having a sexually transmitted disease, just cut your damn penis off, right? Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, it would work, but I mean, it's like, wait a minute, is that the right, is that the right approach here? And so there is some, in my view, some um, potential harm in just bottoming out people's cholesterol, you know, and it's like, you know, because we know that all cause mortality goes down. We know that. Uh, you know, potentially some some studies, dementia goes up. Studies show that increased risk for violence and suicidality and depression and the immune system is is dependent upon some of these uh, uh, lipoproteins. So anyway, that's kind of a an overview of some of that research that's just come out. But they, like I said, they're running that study for a year. And so why did they pick a year? Because they thought they are going to need it for five years. But literally the guy who's a world-leading expert on this says, no, you can easily see progression within one year. And so we won't know until February if anybody had any progression. 
And I, you know, again, I'm speculating here, obviously, but I suspect we're going to see little to no progression. I suspect we might even see some regression in some people. And that will be, you know, mind blowing. Well, wait a minute, high cholesterol in their plaque went backwards. That doesn't make sense, right? So if they, you know, again, that that hasn't been demonstrated yet, but if that shows that, which I, which I have clinically anecdotally seen that, but if that shows that during this study, then you've got a real, you know, kind of a shit storm. It's going to stir up a lot of stuff because people are going to be like, you know, this is already doing it. And you see the retractors out there and they're attacking the credibility of the authors or going after them ethically. They're, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's what you expect. I mean, anytime you push into uh, some sort of status quo thing, people don't like that. And they're, and they're, they're, they respond very aggressively, which, you know, I, I, they knew that was coming. I knew it was coming. And, you know, you just have to weather the storm and, still push on and hopefully hopefully truth and uh your common sense will, will prevail hey friend thanks for listening if you really enjoy this podcast it would be really appreciated if you left us a five-star review on spotify apple or subscribe to our content on youtube this helps us get to a larger reach and a larger audience to spread this wonderful free education yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see over the next couple of years as that study continues to see what the results are. I remember just listening to a few things on it yesterday and reading some of some of the papers that people have been sharing. And I know Ken Berry and Dave Feldman and uh, Nick Norwitz, I think, did like a live stream talking about it. So I caught some of that as well. And I saw your video that you were posting about it. It was super fascinating to see just that one fact that it seemed like there was less placking in the in the lean mass hyperresponder group, which was super fascinating. And um, I've been a little bit of a lean mass hyperresponder myself, not as crazy as some of the numbers I've seen, even with some of the friends that I've made here in the space. So it's super interesting to see. Another study that I found really fascinating that you mentioned recently, uh, my friend Nick Norwitz uh, was about the uh, Oreo cookie study. <laughs> so I'd love to just bring that up for, for a minute sure, because it's sure. super fascinating. And sort of, it kind of goes into that debate of like, okay, with these types of individuals that seem to be metabolically healthy and lean, is that are we looking at, you know, low glycogen stores within the liver, within the muscle and these things? And that's why we're seeing these changes in cholesterol. And his study was super cool. So I look forward to seeing what he does with that. But maybe you can kind of explain what. Yeah. What and I, and I talked to Nick. I talked to Nick quite frequently. Uh, you know, we, we, in fact, I was in a meeting, research meeting with him yesterday. Uh, we're trying to, we're trying to get some other research done. Um, yeah, I mean that 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 goes to the thought of why why do people's cholesterol go up super high when they go low carb, right? In some cases, and that that, that so called lipid energy model, and and as you alluded to, when our sort of body stores of energy, particularly carbohydrate based energy, glycogen, are low, that sends a signal to our liver to say, hey, we need to traffic more energy to those cells because those cells are kind of hungry, right? So they need they need to, they need to fuel themselves or to to, to run their Metabolism, and so what? What does our liver do? Well, it packages up all these lipoproteins to to transfer triglycerides and free fatty acids, uh, leaving so that we can you know, basically run our system, right? And so, uh, so you see, uh, the, the 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 sort of prediction would be, if I am lean and low on glycogen, my gl- my, my my cholesterol is going to go up, right? That's the prediction. And how would you counter that prediction? So how would you reverse it? Well, you would say I'm going to provide myself extra energy in the form of uh, carbohydrate, right? And so he chose the most ridiculous example he could think of, Oreo cookies, because they are, you know, everybody would, I think most people would clearly suggest that a diet of Oreo cookies is not good for you, right? So he said, I'm going to do this most egregious, ridiculous thing and eat a dozen Oreo cookies a day for three weeks. And sure enough, he dropped his LDL cholesterol from, I think it was like three, 380 down to two. 10 or something like, or, or 110, 110 or something like that. So he dropped it almost 300 points in the course of a couple of weeks. And he's going to contrast that to a statin. So he's on a, on a high dose statin. And already the Oreo cookies have outperformed the statin, you know, as far as reducing uh, uh, LDL cholesterol. So the, the so I mean, maybe Oreo cookie is going to have a, a label on the thing, heart healthy reduces cholesterol. You know, we'll see, you know, sponsored by the American Heart Association. You know, you know, so, I mean, it's just this ridiculous example to show you that this theory has some real holes in it that, you know, why does LDL cholesterol go up? Is it bad when it goes up because of, you know, relative low energy states or are there other reasons for it to go up? And the, 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 you know, there's other data that points us, you know, if you look at fasting studies, they've got data on that. If, if people go on a week long fast, their cholesterol generally goes up between 30 and 70%. 
just by not eating. So you're going to tell me that not eating is now giving me heart disease. I mean, it, 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 so again, it's it's one of those sort of things. I look at it as as a biomarker that is context dependent, you know, and and you know, the, the and this is something that Dave and the guys on the study are very important to point out. It doesn't mean that if you uh, sit on your butt all day and eat, you know, Twinkies and donuts and and and, and are obese, that your cholesterol being high is not a problem because it probably still is in that situation. It's just that in these particular situations, which unfortunately are rare, because no one is metabolically healthy in this country. You know, you look at the data out there; it's like freaking ninety percent of us are either, you know, pre-diabetic or hypertensive or visceral fat laden, and so. In that situation, now that LDL cholesterol is probably problematic. But if you can manage to get yourself into a, you know, healthy state, which I think is very easy to do. I mean, I, I mean, it's very doable for most people. Then perhaps, you know, we can say that maybe that LDL cholesterol, because we've had a very uh, myopic LDL focused, you know, attention for for decades now, and, and driven by a lot of other cardiologists. And to be fair, I mean, the, some of the drug companies certainly don't dissuade us from that because they've made literally hundreds upon hundreds of billions of dollars on that. And, you know, I, like I said, it, for some people, it probably was beneficial to lower their lower their cholesterol. But at the same time, um, were there, you know, sort of side effects or problems associated with that? Most likely, for sure. And some people probably, had they been focused on maybe improving their metabolic health, like a lot of us are pushing for now, you know, it might have been a better way to do that. Yeah, you know, I think that's really important what you were saying about the B- LDL being potentially a dependent variable and not sort of the the boogeyman or wolf in sheep's clothing as it's been sort of been portrayed over the last so many decades. And I think the more you get into the space and the more you explore for yourself, you find that a lot of things are like that in centralized medicine. There's not necessarily an A equals B all the time. And I think that's an important nuance for people to just understand, even with what you just said about cholesterol and certainly in the context of eating junk food all the time, yeah, you might want to worry about your LDL or, and your cholesterol in general because it's probably not the same because <laughs> it's a very deep, a very different variable. Yeah, I mean, it leads to kind of lazy medicine as I see it. I mean, you know, because, you know, if, if you're like a primary care physician and, and 95% of the people walk in your, your, your office are, and most people that go to the doctor are kind of sick. So you're like, well, yeah, everybody comes in here, you know, they're, they're, they're overweight, they're pre-diabetic. Here's your statin, right? Or here's your PCSK9 inhibitor or whatever. That's probably reasonable. But if you got people in there who are like, look, wait a minute, I'm lean, I work out, my blood glucose is normal, my triglycerides are normal, my HDL is high, I have no inflammation. Wait a minute, maybe I'm, maybe I don't, maybe this doesn't apply to me. Most physicians aren't exposed to that to know the difference. And so there it is. They get an algorithm. Literally, when I was, you know, when I was actively clinically practicing, you know, you would get literally, you know, computer reminders. Oh, look, this you know, this flags it. Here's a red flag. Well, you better prescribe this drug. Kind of like to help you, all right? To help you, and and yeah, most people do it. Okay, yeah, okay, here you go. Because if you don't do that, then you got all these damn red flags. You got to justify why you didn't do it. Like, well, that's more work. That's damn. That's more work for me. Huh? Let's get the guy the prescription. Get him out of my office. Are you self-employed or a small business owner and are tired of paying hundreds of dollars a month to centralized health insurance companies for minimal coverage because there is no alternative? Well, I have good news for you. There is. And this podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a more decentralized alternative to health insurance, and it uses community and crowdfunding to help its members pay for emergencies when they do happen. They incentivize and prioritize health and personal responsibility and share the thought that you should really only be using the centralized healthcare system when emergencies do happen. This is what I am on board with, and I have personally signed up for CrowdHealth since I left the corporate engineering world and the medical benefits that come with it. If you want to learn more, you can check out our episode with CEO and founder Andy Schoonover, or you can head over to joincrowdhealth.com and use code DRADIO, D-R-A-D-I-O, when you sign up to get a discounted rate of only $99 for the first three months. Centralized healthcare is one of the biggest issues in our society today, and I really love what CrowdHealth is doing to provide an alternative for people who care. Yeah, algorithmic medicine is is an issue, especially because it creates sort of a, a bilateral issue, both on the patient side and the physician side, because 
You have the patient that's generally not educated and sort of is going to the doctor for, for the right thing to do, like with good intention, usually. And then you have the physician that is now, I mean, there, there's so many variables. Like I actually hate blaming one side or the other because it's just, it's just like a conflated systematic problem that we've had developing for a long period of time. So I don't like to point specific fingers, but I, it is sort of like at the end of the day, uh, up to education for, on people to hopefully make better decisions that become better critical thinkers. I think that's really the solution is great, better critically thinking people. And then you can sort of sort these things out for yourself. It's just that you have to have the intuition or desire to be curious about it, which not everyone has innately. Um, but hopefully like through things like this, more and more people, as we've seen, like we've seen a lot of gains in like even the cardboard movement over the last five years since you've written your book, certainly that's very promising. Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, you're not going to be able to save everybody. And, you know, you know, you know, when you look at like just when it goes to like food buying, I mean, most people, probably 95 percent of the people still, what does it taste like and how much does it cost? And that's that is their decision algorithm. And that's, you know, it tastes good and it's cheap. That's that's a problem, obviously. But I mean, you, you know, like I said, it is a slow process to educate. And we've been sort of I always I always, you know, there's Mark Twain has this funny saying. He says, I was educated once. It took me years to get over it, you know. And so uh, it's like, you know, you, even as a physician, you know, I say I figured I came to this conclusion despite the fact that I was a physician because I was trained in this sort of traditional model. And, you know, and, and you know, I mean, like I said, it's 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 rigorous training and you are you learn a lot but at the same time you're you're kind of intentionally directed on a certain path and, and you've got a very like you said sort of a one way of thinking about things and when it when all of a sudden you know somebody says something different you're like oh those people are what is these homeopathy people these crazy ass wackos you know it's anything that questions what you've been taught in medical school or being taught by uh, your continuing medical education was paid by the pharmaceutical industry is considered dangerous, wrong, quackery, and it's hard to break free of that. And, you know, like I said, the, the only reason I did was because I, you know, sort of was looking at my own health and sort of noticed some things and then had the audacity to try diets on my patients and saw some really interesting things. And so, but I, I would have learned that in a book or, or a research paper that was available to me. So I was kind of like, just kind of serendipitously kind of came across this stuff and, uh, as a lot of people are discovering this now, and as you mentioned, it is it's growing quite well. I mean, it's kind of funny, you know, that you talk about the carnivore thing. And like I said, I'm obviously a carnivore advocate, but I don't. I, you'll never hear me saying it's the only way, and everybody needs to do that, and all this stuff. Some, I, you know, I hear some people within the community say that. I kind of like, I look at it like, well, maybe that might be not the most effective way to get the message out there. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly growing. I mean, I think I think like I said, I think the cream will rise to the top. The the, the the top, the truth will eventually prevail. It's hard to, you know, there's a lot of you know, as you guys know, we're in a very contentious time. People are b battling about politics and wars and COVID and all this crap, and everybody has an opinion. And it's hard to really know the truth in some of those instances. Like you know, like we'll say the climate like stuff. I, I literally can't tell. I mean, I, there's no way for me to independently verify whether the climate is changing or not, or what ocean temperatures up or down I, or the Arctic ice sheet. I just don't have the luxury to be able to fly up there or have a, you know, ocean thermometer that I can, you know, calibrate with. But what I can do is I can assist my own health very easily. I mean, it's quite apparent to me when I feel good and when I don't, when I, when I, when I'm fat, when I'm lean, you know, when I join certain when they don't. And so that's something that's hard to sort of gaslight people out of. I think we're seeing at least in that aspect, people are saying, hey, wait a minute, I, I'm literally better. And you can't discon you you cannot unconvince me of that. You can't un you can't gaslight me and, and, and tell me I was better before when I was fat, sick and everything hurt. Right. I mean, it just it's hard to do that. Right. Yeah. And that's why I think the the research that you're doing is so important because I think you could throw out like 98% of research because they're all on sick people. So for me, you know, I'm 27, I'm healthy, I'm active, I eat real food, I go outside. There's nothing for me there. Um, so another question, just especially on the cholesterol piece is how do other lifestyle habits play into that? Because like we know that sunlight has a direct impact on cholesterol sulfation. And, you know, that's, I've noticed personally that in the summer, uh, my cholesterol levels are lower. 
Uh, is it, this is something I've never heard discussed in the mainstream. Obviously, they tell you that the sun is bad for you, uh, which is another fun narrative to play. But uh, I'm curious your opinion there uh, as well. Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're obviously, I mean, this is one thing that, that Dave Feldman, when I started talking to him about seven years ago, he, he started doing these personal experiments where he was, he was literally drawing his own blood cholesterol like every day. And he was getting the wild wow. variations. And my thought was like, well, you know, it's it's always the same. It doesn't change much. Maybe it fluctuates a tiny bit. But it can, it can it can dramatically move, as can many other labs. And this is something like anybody, anytime somebody, because I get so many people send me their labs. And I'm like, man, I don't know what to do with that. I mean, I don't know anything about you. A bunch of labs on a sheet really are not that helpful. Uh, and so, like, you know, people say, like, you, like vitamin D. We hear about vitamin D. I'm like, well. First thing, first question I always ask is, what is the diurnal, vari- vari- diurnal variation on this stuff? You know, because most people don't know this. Vitamin D can fluctuate 30% over the day. So it's like, what, what time of day did you take the test, right? Or throughout the course of the year, summertime, wintertime. I mean, we, we, some people know that. But, but yeah, you're right with those labs. Uh, you know, so many things can impact that. You know, we talk about fasting. and I'm sure there's, te- you know, I mean, like the microbiome, which is, which is kind, of a, a, kind of a hot topic in the last few years. I mean, literally everything affects it. You know, it's just like, how are you going to predict that? How are you going to use that data? One one stool sample to to sort of design your entire life life based on that. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I haven't specifically looked at the effect of sunlight on cholesterol. Uh, I'm sure there is some level of diurnal variation. You know, we know that like. Uh, like I said, cholesterol will respond to illness, right? So that's why a lot of people will see uh, people people uh, admitted for a, 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 a an MI, a myocardial infarction, or cancer, their cholesterol will rapidly drop because it's part of the immune process, and so um, so it's being used up, I guess, for 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 immune purposes. And you know, there's like I said, when you look at this all cause mortality data, and you see that. The people who live the longest have higher cholesterol, right? I mean, that's that. There are numerous studies that support that, and of course, the cardiologists will say, "Well, we've got this dose response uh, curve uh, uh, showing that that uh, uh, you know cardiovascular disease increases with this." And then people with low cholesterol, you say, "What about all these people with low cholesterol that are dying early?" And they'll say, "Well, it's all reverse causality." And you know, the only reason their cholesterol is down is because they're already dying. And I said, "Well, wait a minute. There's studies that go back." 20 years and they've got low cholesterol 20 years ago and they die early. How do you explain that? And they kind of don't, they kind of ignore that, I guess a little bit. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, it's funny, you know, you think how, how long have we been studying cholesterol, at least since the beginning of the 20th century, you know, 1910, when we were looking at rabbits, fed high cholesterol diets, you know, rabbits are herbivore, they don't eat cholesterol typically. Uh, but since that time, we still haven't figured it out. We're still debating this stuff. We're still like, oh, wait a minute, maybe it's oxidized LDL, maybe it's glycated LDL, maybe it's you know lipoprotein little a, or you know. So it's 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 become so much so complicated, and you know we we tend to look at it as a very binary black and white thing. And uh, even within lipidology, I think most people would disagree with that at this point. Yeah, and I even within scientific studying i mean there's so many people that have their hand in this honeypot of what can i get out of this study for you know personal gain profit gain whoever's funding the study you have to look at like so many different things just within one study to even come out of it being like okay is this data like a legitimate thing how was the study done like what were the variables all the all the stuff and especially when it comes to like um epidemiology and stuff like that or the a lot of the the ones where they just fill out these pamphlets and stuff over time, like it's just like so much yeah. stuff that you can just throw away. Well, I mean, one of the things that Tristan alluded to this is like, what? Are they, who are they studying? Are they studying me? Yeah, you know, are, are they studying healthy twenty-seven-year-old males with no other health risk factors? Are they studying fifty-year-olds with already known, you know, several comorbidities? And so you have to say, like, look, does this even apply to me? And and in many cases, it doesn't. And so it's it's one of those things. Where- yeah, and so that. That just kind of brings up the question too of like even within blood work, it's like if you're doing an average of a population, but 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 the population's like dramatically more sick than maybe you are. It's like how valuable is the blood work generally? Like how much should we be looking into it? Yeah, and I, I've I've taken a lot of criticism because first time I was on Rogan's podcast, you know, it's kind of funny. I went on, I've been on twice now. The first time he thought I was a nut, right? I could tell he's like this dude's nuts, right? And now he's like, oh my god, Connor was the best thing, you know. He's I mean, very different different vibe, you know. Uh, because he's actually seen what I've seen now. 
And I said, look, Joe, I'm not sure what blood work is really going to be all that helpful in this situation. And he thought, you're crazy. Everybody needs blood work. Well, why do we check blood? I mean, why do we do the reason we check it's because convenient. It's easy to get, you know, it may not be the most valuable information we have about our body. You know, probably, I mean, honestly, you probably would get a lot more information if you did tissue biopsies on people, but guess what? That's painful. It costs a lot of money. There's complications associated with it. Uh, so we don't do that. So we use this sort of proxy measure that's like, okay, what's trafficking in the blood right now? And what does that tell me about the deep structures of my brain or my liver or something like that? We can, we can glean some things, but um, it leaves out a lot of detail. And like I said, like I mentioned, it is subject to very rapid and, and often significant fluctuations day to day, or, or even, you know, like a blood glucose, for instance, you know, if all I had was one blood glucose reading a day and I were to predict everything based on that, man, what was I doing? Did I just eat? Have I just exercised real hard? Um, you know, you, you, you don't know what the, it's like, it's like, the, it's like going, you know, it's like, uh, uh, going outside in January and taking a temperature reading and said, oh, that's the weather. You know, so wait a minute, it was the middle of January. It's not like that. And, you know, I mean, that, that's literally what we do with blood testing. So I think there's some real limitations to that. Yeah, I think I realized that about a year or two ago. I was like, you know, it's easy to get obsessed with these numbers, even yeah. testosterone, anything. It's like, oh, I want, you know, four-digit testosterone level, but, you know, when did you get it? What did you do that week or the day before even? So I, I think there's a lot of... Uh, room for improvement, but I know that's what you're trying to do at Rivero as well, kind of provide more more customized uh, care for people. Because yeah, if you're in, like I'm in Wyoming right now, it's freezing. If someone's in Florida or uh, Texas, it, it could be different. But I kind of want to get into maybe the precursor to what cholesterol levels as well. You talk about the one from, you know, depleting carbohydrates, but also in terms of the fat content, some debates uh, in general on uh, carnivore or you know protein versus fat composition is, is always ongoing and I've kind of had more of a revelation recently podcasting with uh, Dr. Chafee, Dr. Lazo Boros and Michael Crawford and they're all kind of like from this evolutionary lens really bullish on fat like high fat content is really what we were designed to thrive on and I'm curious, and that's obviously gone down a lot in the past 10,000 years, in the past 100 years, even more so. I'm curious on your take on, you know, the protein versus fat consumption and just fat in general. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm very familiar with the, the evolutionary uh, sort of arguments. This I've made them in many cases. I got done a did, did lecture in Germany last month, and I talked a lot about the evolutionary stuff. And, uh, you know, I think it is pretty clear that at some point in human evolution, Homo sapiens being, you know, the most recent, what we are, Homo sapiens sapien, 300,000 years old or so. I mean, humans go back, dating maybe back as far as Homo habilis about three, three million years ago. But, um, you know, it, it looks like, you know, we were largely dependent upon large, you know, megafauna, which are big animals, which have a lot of fat in them. And that sort of opportunity kind of started to go away around 180, 100,000 years ago as those animals died out and as the human species continued to, uh, you know, increase in number. And so then we were left hunting leaner animals. And so as we hunted leaner and leaner animals, we still had the same energy requires. We still had that big, big old brain that we had to fuel. And so then we started relying more on plants and carbohydrates and eventually agriculture and then kind of everything went south from there in, in a way individually allowed us to have stable population centers without moving as we can build civilizations. But the overall human health kind of went down and in, in, in I think there's pretty good evidence to support that. But as far as what I see, because, you know, who cares? I mean, what, what's happening in 2023? What I see today is that, you know, um, if you're going to be on a carnivore diet in particular, you know, you got to have enough fat. I mean, you got to have enough. And so like for, for me, I eat a relatively high protein diet because I train my ass off. I'm trying, you know, I'm worried about getting strong and, you know, all, I, I just enjoy that stuff. Even still, I still eat mostly fat as most of my calories. I mean, my calories generally are about 70% of my diet. You know, that's, that's just the reality. That's the reality of eating meat. I mean, you're going to get a lot of fat and that's why it's demonized because, oh my God, there's a lot of fat in there, right? Um, and then what I do see like uniquely is that there are some conditions where fat is even more, more valuable, I think, or at least seems to be like, a lot of the like neurologic conditions I see where people that are dealing with things like multiple sclerosis or even, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, mental health disorders like depression and things like that, they seem to do better for, on an even higher fat approach. And so maybe they're maybe they're closer to these ketogenic macronutrient ratios. Maybe they're hitting eighty percent of their calories coming from fat in many cases. Uh, you know, again, there's there's percentages and, and actual amounts that you're consuming, and they may not always be the same. But I think that uh, fat is absolutely important. I mean, obviously, we have essential fatty acids, we have essential amino acids. We don't have any essential carbohydrates. It's not that you can't use them, and there's not a use for them in some cases, but they're they're essential for a reason, and we have to have them. And I do think that um, many people feel better on a, on a you know, more of a fat-based diet. And there's a guy named Amber O'Hearn who I have a lot of respect for. And she she will, she will, kind of considers humans as lipovores rather than carnivorous. We were seeking out, uh, you know, bone marrow and brain material to, to consume early on and part of our evolution, which I think is true. Uh, so, yeah, fat is critically important. Um, I, you know, I mean, you can do a leaner diet for a short period of time, maybe you want to lean out a little bit, but that is not sustainable over the long period. I mean, I, I you know, I, I occasionally, every once in a while, I get vain and want to get get a little leaner, and I'll be like, okay, I'm going to lean out for a while, so I'll, I'll reduce my fat a little bit, you know, kind of cycle it in and and get pretty, you know, pretty lean, and then I'm like, man, I can't do this forever. I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to do it. This is, I'm not happy this way. There's this sort of dumb fat and happy analogy, and you know, not that, not that I consider myself dumb, but you know, I feel a little better with a little bit more fat in me, quite honestly. Wow. Well, I don't know about you, but this episode is making me a little peckish. And you know what sounds good? Some beef liver crisps from our sponsor, Nose to Tail Provisions, who provide 100% grass-fed and finished wild game animal products sourced from America. Their completely microplastic-free products are absolutely delicious and great if you need something in a pinch or just love a good snack. Each product is packed with the most nutrition possible. I love their new viral dust bison liver seasoning. And with code Tristan10, you'll be saving 10% on every bit of your order as well as supporting our show. That's sort of the the trend I've seen with other people that I've gotten to know and even myself is that you can kind of go for a little bit, but then there's like that little bit of rabbit starvation that starts to happen. You're like, oh man, this is the energy starting to go down. Vito might be changing, but yeah. What do you think about um, the idea of like seasonal eating plants but in sort of like a seasonal basis yeah well i mean you know you know you met you alluded to the book i wrote when you read my book i say humans are omnivores i mean i literally very intentionally say that because i do think we're omnivores however you know i could i consider carnivore a therapeutic protocol and i think it's final to do it as a lifestyle too i mean quite honestly i think people i I think people have a spectrum they can live on some people prefer carnivore like i do i I prefer just eating meat you know that's that's 90 literally 98 percent of my diet is freaking steak every day you know, red meat, you know, that's what I eat. You know, sometimes there'll be a little bit of seafood and eggs and dairy. And every once in a while, I have something that's sort of off plan, but that's just really infrequent. Um, I think it can be fun. You know, like I said, I think that, uh, you know, obviously, depending upon where you, you know, like if we, if we, we just roll back the clock, not even 150 years, I mean, before refrigeration, before, you know, mass transportation, you know, you know, intercontinental transportation of goods, uh, or at least to, to, to the degree we have today, you wouldn't have much choice. I mean, your 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 variety, like people are talking, oh, well, we 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 have so much variety. How can you live without that? I mean, I mean, you walk to a grocery store a hundred years ago, and there's probably you know fifty products in there, maybe something like that. Now there's got ten thousand of them, and they're fluorescent green and blue and purple and Captain Crunch flavored maple syrup. I mean, it's just like what the hell? I mean, it's just like that's not even food anymore. So um, yeah, but to your question of can you cyclically cycling in and out of carbs. Sure. I think some people do fine with that. I mean, I think that's something I'm, I, like I said, I'm, you're never going to get me to say only carnivore hundred percent of the time for all the people. I, I just think, I, I don't think that's even the truth. I mean, I think that's, it's unrealistic. Um, and you know, if I was, you know, if you and I were walking around in central Europe a hundred thousand years ago, and we came across a patch of berries. I'm damn sure we would have eaten them. You know, I'm sure we would have, or, or even if there were Twinkies on the tree, we would have eaten them too. You know, it's just like, um, so, so, I mean, we do it, what's available to us and, you know, like, but I said, those things are constantly available to us, you know, as you mentioned, you know, fruit grows, you know, seasonally, at least outside of the tropics. And even in the tropics, they have growing cycles where, uh, some of it's not always available. Well, what is interesting, like, you know, we look at, uh, this is an important point, geographic diversity of species. Humans are the most geographically dispar- diver- uh, diverse 
you know, vertebrate species on the planet. I mean, there's insects that kind of, you know, are fungi that have in every kind of niche. But when it comes to, you know, major animals, we're it. I mean, we live everywhere. We live in the, we live, we got people in Antarctica, we got people in the tropics and every, every region in between. And why were we able to to exploit all that is because our ability to acquire nutrition, uh, even before mass transport, was a, dependent upon our ability to catch an animal and eat it, right? Because what you know, because people say, well, what plant, what plant grows in every season, in every climate, in every geographic distribution on the planet? And there's none. There's nothing you can tell me. So, how, if that's the case, how can it be essential for me? Like, what magic goji berry grows everywhere if I need that, right? But I can find an animal just about anywhere. Right, and I can eat every animal pretty much outside of a, maybe a puffer fish or something. There's a few that are, that are out, off limits, but literally 99.9 percent of animals are food for us or can be, and that's why we were able to, to to be so geographically diverse. And then behind us, the second most geographically diverse species are basically dogs or wolves. Basically, wolves, foxes. They 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 inhabit every region as well. Arctic foxes and jungle foxes and all these things. So, and they have a very similar diet. They they consume. They consume flesh, right? I think this is the component that is just missed. And um, right now, I mean, in Wyoming, there's literally nothing. The yeah. natives would have been eating bison. And then maybe in July, August, September, they would have got a little bit of berries, maybe some honey, and that's it. There's so I think this nuance. Running all, over every, all those antelopes that are all over the place. Yeah, and they're damn lean, too. <laughs> there's not much fat on them. But, yeah. you know, you see people like Paul Saladino in Costa Rica eating fruit and honey. And it's like, yeah, that, that makes sense for him. Right. It's growing where he is and it's working. But that's where I think this nuance gets lost. And that's why I like your message and how you kind of don't, um, you know, you kind of explain it pretty well is that, you know, we are omnivores, but meat is always in season and meat is the most nutrient dense food. And it just depends. Yeah, I, I love that last said I, 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 that you said meat is always in season. That's a really that's a really interesting concept, isn't it? You know, because it's like, you know, we don't have a you know, a berry season. You know, we have a berry season. Like, like I live in Washington State. I mean, there's rat, yeah. blackberries grow all over my property. I mean, and from late August through mid September, man, there's berries everywhere. But outside of that, I don't see a thing. You know, and it's it's uh, it's. But but yeah, like you said, there's deer, there's meat, there's there's meat always running around. Yeah, and you can get into really the science of it and like the fat carbohydrate intake and how it affects your mitochondria. It's it's real and it makes sense, but. I know we don't have a ton of time left. I wanted to get back kind of to the the research and the funding for this research. Like you're really, you know, ruffling some feathers. Obviously, the NIH, any centralized body of, of funding is, is not going to support this. Like you said, they're already discrediting you across the board. Um, how have you, how have we gone about like funding this research and, and how do we see this continuing going forward? Because this is something I'm, you know, every guy I talk to in this, I guess, decentralized health space they don't have a lot of funding and, and something I'm working on as well. And I think Bitcoin plays a role. And I know you've, uh, you're, you're I'm, bullish I'm Bitcoin. hodling, man. I'm, 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 I just, I signed up with a company called Unchained to do this multi yeah. sort of deal. So I feel a little better about that. I, I don't, I'm not an expert on it in any way, but I, you know, I, I, I at least I, I align with his philosophy, if nothing else. But, um, yeah, I mean, the research is, you know, I raised, well, my, myself and my partner at, 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 who's now at the, the, one of my co-founders at Rivera, we raised about two hundred thousand dollars a few years ago, and we're going to do research with that. We're you know as soon as our company is finished launching, and then we can start our data collection period, we will turn some of that into into research, and that's great. But we can't do it all, right? And so one of the reasons you know I've been like trying to get research done on this for years, but it, it is really challenging, you know, because it costs money. And I've got research teams that are like, we'd love to do it, we're happy to do it. And I, you know, we had we had run a proposal by quote, quote, basically the beef industry, something called the NCBA, the Beef Checkoff, whose literal job is to promote beef, right? And they get like forty, fifty million dollars every year to spend on, you know, beef. It's what's for dinner. It was the last thing you probably remember that they did. Uh, they haven't done a very good job in my mind. They, I mean, you know, we've got since the nineteen seventies, beef consumption is down seventy or thirty percent. Uh, half a million ranchers have gone out of business since, and so it's kind of like like. You guys are getting paid to promote this. Your tracker is not so good. So I approached them and I said, hey, look, here's a study uh, we want to do on, you know, a, basically a carnivore or a beef-based diet versus diabetes. And they literally rejected it because they've got like a dietitian who leads their research panel. So I think humans are omnivores and studying these types of diets is unhelpful. And I said, you know, you know, even if you think humans are omnivores and, and not everybody should be eating this diet, this is a very powerful study in the way that 
it can show you what beef actually does, not what a hamburger and French fries and a Coke does, because that's what most of these studies are based upon, right? And it's, they just, you know, there's some politics that are going in there. So I went on Rogan, I, I, I complained about this a little bit. And so now I've had a bunch of people light me up and said, hey, I work in the beef industry and I think this is kind of bullshit too. And this totally makes sense to do this type of study. Because even Rogan's re- reaction was, of course, that's the only way you should study this, right? Because it makes so much sense. Well, let's get rid of all these confounding variables. Let's get all these other dietary distractors out of there. It tells you, no, you can't study in a single food uh, the effect on the body when you're eating 300 other ones at the same time, right? Harvard just came out with a study that said beef caused 68% chance, or 62% increased chance of diabetes. And they included lasagna and sandwiches as part of their red meat matrix. And they also didn't, they didn't even account for how much sugar was being eaten by these groups. So it's like, what, how is that good research? But guess what? Got national headlines. It was on CNN. It was on the New York Times. Every major article shows us out there. And so I'm like, look, you need a study that shows a beef like beats diabetes. And that, that was my pitch to the, the the CEO of the NCBA a couple of years ago when I talked to him. I said, look, because when Harvard had their little study, it wasn't, it's not a great study, but it's at least this data is in, in there. So we want to do an interventional trial. And so I'm in, I'm in talks with a number of groups that are hopefully – in fact, I have, a, I have a meeting tomorrow with the funding team to see about and, and putting the researchers together with the funding team to see if we can get this going. Um, but it is. It's an uphill slog, you know. And, I mean, you know, there's a few, like, uh, you know, wealthy people that have an interest. I know Jan Mizuki and, and her husband, Dave, who the co-founder of, or the founder of Roblox, the video game. I don't know, maybe some of you guys used to play that when you were kids or something like that. But his wife, they, they had a son who had bipolar disorder, which was basically put in remission through a ketogenic diet. So now they are like funding some of this stuff. And like, you know, it's it's uh, um, it's interesting. I mean, we've got a study that, that will be released. It's, 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 right now it's a case series. It's like a case for series on IBD, inflammatory biology disease and carnivore. We'll get that in the literature and then we'll do an intervention trial after that. So it's like, here it is in an intervention. Here it is in case reports. We know what happens. This phenomenon happens. Let's see how frequent it is. Let's, let's do an intervention trial. We're hoping... Uh, is to do a, a you know randomized control trial vegan versus carnivore with inflammatory bowel disease, which I think would be we're really really uh, enlightening, and maybe even get some vegan authors on the paper if they're willing to, because that would really be like a study that I think would be awesome. So there's some neat things in the work that that I'm I'm trying to make happen in, in the background, but yeah, I mean it's it's tough. I mean you got to connect the right people, you got to you got to sell the message that why it's so valuable because so many people like. Uh, carnivore some fad diet. We want to test that, but I mean, you guys can see the value of, of, of this type of research and telling and answering a question. Because up until now, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, you got, you go up to the, the average person on the street and ask them how much steak they eat. And they're like, oh man, I love that stuff, but oh, I don't like, I can't eat much. Got to, I got to watch it. Right? They're told they they literally believe that it's going to make them die if they eat it. And it's it's you know, in my view, it's crazy to think that, but it does. Yeah, it's it's like you said, the truth resonates. And this is a big, you know, foundation, foundational virtue of, of decentralization. But the problem is there's so much social programming that has just conditioned everybody to think a certain way. So we do need to fight back with with research, with sound research. And it's a money pit and there's no funding sources. So that's something I'm working on as well. And I do think that Bitcoin well, um, yeah, over Bitcoin, the long term. If Bitcoin goes up to a million, then we'll get some exactly. studies. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's right. And all the big, a lot of the Bitcoiners, I was just in Austin too. They're, yeah. they're all, you know, into carnivore and anti-seed yeah. oils. So yeah. if we hold the money, you know, we'll yeah. be able to fund the research. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's funny with the Bitcoin thing. Cause I've, I've, I've been asked to speak in a number of Bitcoin conferences next year. And so I I'll probably do at least one or two of them. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, like I said, I, Saifedean Amos, who wrote Bitcoin Standards, a friend of mine, and he actually was, was carnivore before I was. Wow. Uh, and he, he wanted to write a book with me on the carnivore diet. That was his idea. And then he got sidetracked in writing the Bitcoin Standard, and then you know, the rest is history for him. But uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, uh, you know, like I said, I know there's a lot of people within the Bitcoin community that um, are interested in this stuff to say the least i mean it's, it's weird there's some bitcoin vegans which i laugh about it's like you know how do they get in but no it's funny I, I and i honestly i don't have any real animosity towards vegans i just you know i think people should be allowed to do whatever the hell they want when it comes to diet it's just when you start calling me a animal abuser and rapist and murderer because i'm eating the same way every human ever since the beginning of time has eaten is now somehow some evil vilified thing it's just insane in my view 
Yeah, no, hundred percent, and and I agree totally. And I'm I'm excited. You know, the next five to ten years, I think we can really make a huge impact on the research, on the movement, the education. You know, podcasts. It's it's great. Yeah. So I know you have to head out in a minute. So Sean, where can people find more about what you're doing, uh, Rivero, yeah. uh, and yeah. in general? Yeah, well, uh, let me just first mention Rivero.com. It is a uh, Rivero.com is where you can go to sign up. We are fifty states licensed in all fifty states. We provide health care, which is you know, lifestyle based. I mean, the goal is you know using diets, using you do using lifestyle uh, uh, sort of techniques to you know treat root cause of disease, get people off meds. You know, re, you know, put disease in remission or reverse or whatever you want to call it. That's our focus, and we've got doctors that are totally on board with that. Um, but as far as like social media, and this is the other thing, it's so important. You know, not only to get this research out there, but to share it. I mean, it's got to be it's got to be disseminated broadly because. I mean, New York Times won't run it, so it's up to us to get it out there as, as, a, as a group. And I always tell people, hey, you got to share this stuff. Um, but you can go to my social media. I'm on Instagram at Sean, S-H-A-W-N, Baker, B-A-K-E-R, 1967. I'm on uh, X, which is formerly Twitter, uh, at S Baker MD. Got a YouTube channel, Sean Baker MD. And I actually have TikTok, which I'm always embarrassed to mention, but it's also Sean Baker MD, so... Anyway, guys, thank you for so much for having me on. This has been a fun chat. I'm able to do it again sometime when we get more research to, to report. So awesome stuff. Absolutely. Thanks so much for coming on, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. 